Okay, it's 8.30, so let's go ahead and get started today. And good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing this morning? Doing good, hopefully. Yeah, end of week 10, midterm in one week. So I know uh, it must be a busy time for you guys. So, uh, so I appreciate you guys waking up early to come to the lecture today, uh, especially when I know a lot of you guys have you know, other stuff going on. Okay, um, so the plan for today is we're gonna finish up our lecture notes on Navier Stokes. Uh, so this is going to be the last lecture that's going to be on uh, next week's midterm. Um, and so probably on Monday, we'll, we'll start something new, but we'll be covering on Monday is not going to be on the midterm. And so since today is the last day of, of you know, stuff that's going to be covered on the second midterm, um, I'm going to put out a study guide later today to basically kind of help your study. So um, kind of like what I mentioned before, the midterm is it's not going to be cumulative. And so all the stuff that we did in the first half of the class, like the fluid statics, uh, and Bernoulli, you know, they're not going to be directly onto this uh, on this midterm. Um, you might need to use some of it, like, just like we saw last week with potential flow. You know, we brought Bernoulli back, um, but I'm not going to ask you just a question directly on Bernoulli. Um, and of course, all the fluid static stuff you don't have to worry about. So, um, and so before the lecture, someone asked, um, you know, what homeworks that this midterm is going to be based off of, um, and that's going to be homeworks four and five. Um, so those those would be your the homeworks for you guys to look at to uh, to check the problems. Okay, and just like before, you know, if the the, home, the midterm um, problems are going to be you know very similar to the homework problems. So you know if, if you uh, because you know they're all coming from my head, uh, and so you know they're going to be similar in style, similar in similar in complexity. So if you can do the homework problems, you know, and you really understand them, then you're going to be in good shape for the exam. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so are there any questions on anything before we get started today? All right, go ahead. So the, uh, um, uh, oh, the uh, the midterm review. So uh, yes, I'm going to be, I'm, just like last time, I'm gonna be um, recording a, a midterm review. Um, so I'll probably do that um, over the weekend or maybe on or maybe on Friday because I wanted to wait till we were finished with the lecture today. Um, because just like last time, I'm going to put a poll up on Canvas so you, where you can vote for the topics that you want to see most in the review session. Because uh, probably I'll, I'll only have time to cover two or three topics in that review session. So I want to make sure that they're topics that uh, people you know really want to see and that they kind of feel uncomfortable with. So um, later today with the study guide, I'll put out a poll uh, so that you can vote on the topics that you want. Um, and then, I'll, I'll, and then I'll, I'll record the study session or the review session either on Friday or, or sometime over the weekend and I'll upload it as soon as I, um, as soon as I finish that. Yeah. Midterm is going to be next Wednesday. So a week from today. Yeah. So it'll be a, it'll be a 24 hour exam just like last time. So I'll upload the exam 830 in the morning on Wednesday, um, <clears throat> morning. And then you'll have until 830 AM on Thursday morning to, to finish the exam. Any more questions on the uh, on the midterm or just anything um, in the class? Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> okay, so on Monday uh, we started going over Navier Stokes. Um, oh, do you have a question? Okay. Uh, oh. So the question in the chat is, upon watching the review, will I be ready for the exam? Or what do you say I will need to do to be ready? So the review session will help. Um, so I'm not going to cover everything that, uh, that we did over the last few weeks for the midterm two. Uh, so the midterm review is mostly just to kind of, um, you know, brush, brush you guys up on some, of the, the, some, on some of the topics that you feel most uncomfortable with. Um, so to get ready for the exam, you know, definitely look at the study guide. So the study guide will kind of be an overview of everything um, that's going to be on the second midterm. Uh, and the other thing to do is to go over your homework. So uh, homework four and homework five are going to be the main homeworks that will be on this exam. So if you go over those problems, you really understand them, you know, and, you know, you can do problems that are similar to that. Check out the uh, additional problems that I've already, uh, I've also listed on those, um, on those homeworks too, and those will give you some more practice with those concepts. Um, if you do all that stuff, I think those are those are good ways to study for the exam. Of course, you know, reviewing the lecture notes, reviewing the lecture videos, of course, 
um, would also would also help as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And so last time we were covering the uh, the Navier-Stokes equations, uh, and so they were given by the following. And so last time we kind of just introduced it and just kind of defined what each of the terms meant. Right. Right. So first we have our unsteady terms. We have du dt. Then we have all our convection terms. So if u du dx plus v du dy plus w du dz, okay? And that's on one side of the equation. So that these are all, you can kind of consider everything on the left here to be acceleration terms. Then on the right-hand side, we have one over rho dp dx, okay? And so that was our pressure gradient term plus gx. And so that gx, remember, was the component of gravity in the x direction. And then we have our viscous term, which is, consists of uh, second derivatives, okay? Okay. And so this was um, our Navier-Stokes equations, or this was the momentum part of Navier-Stokes. And then in addition to this, we had conservation of mass. Okay. Right. And so these were all the, uh, um, you know, the, the Navier-Stokes we went over last time. So um, I think one thing that I mentioned before was that this momentum equation up top, you know, this was uh, just the momentum in the x direction, but we also have corresponding equations in the y and the z directions too. Um, so I'm not going to write them down because they're, they're almost the same. Okay? And I think where we left off last time is we kind of um, looked at each group of terms right here, and then we kind of explained their physical significance. Okay? And so that's going to be important just because, you know, with a big equation like this, you know, it, it's not just, you know, don't just look at it as just kind of a math problem, but, you know, any kind of physical equation like this, each of the different terms in the equation has some kind of physical origin, it has some kind of physical meaning. Uh, and so when you're looking at these equations and, you know, you're looking at these groups of terms, I want you to remember, you know, what they actually physically represent. So that's what we did last time, okay? All right, so today what we're going to do is we're, we're actually going to solve this equation, okay? Um, and remember the output that we want from this equation, or by solving it, is a velocity field, okay? Right. Or in other words, we want to solve for the spatial uh, distribution of velocity, okay? Right. And so one example could be like u as a function of y, okay? So that's the that's kind of the first example that we're going to do, right? Um, but you know, there's there's kind of one problem that we need to address first, um, you know, before we start solving these equations, and that problem is that these equations are impossible to solve. Okay, and so uh, what we need to do first is that we need to uh, simplify these equations by applying assumptions. And so this is this is similar to you know what we did with RTT, right? Because remember with RTT we had that kind of big integral expression, and we applied assumptions like steadiness. Uh, we, we you know we assumed um, you know no uh, um, you know that the velocity was was uniform. So you know Navier-Stokes is kind of the same thing where we have to apply assumptions, but it's a little bit more explicit in Navier-Stokes because you know we, we're starting with such a kind of gargantuan equation right here. And so the assumptions that we apply and the correct application of these assumptions is, is really, really critical to solving these kinds of problems, okay? Uh, okay, uh, are there any questions on, on this before we, uh, we move forward? Okay. All right, so let's talk about assumptions. Okay? And so I, I will say that, you know, assumptions is not something that's unique to Navier-Stokes. 
Um, actually, you know, for a lot of your engineering classes, you you use um, assumptions to uh, um, to simplify the equations. They might not just be as explicit as what we're doing right here. Okay. And actually, I've heard from Dr. Weiss that she kind of is is really um, anal about uh, assumptions. That you know, she really makes you list all of them. Um, and she's also you know one of the fluid mechanics instructors. So that, that's probably where she gets it from. Um, you know, I'm uh, you know. Um, I'm, I'm not. I'm not going to be as a, as a as much a stickler as as that. But they are extremely important for for Navier Stokes. And so whenever we're doing Navier Stokes problems, I'm going to require that you actually write down these assumptions because they're they're really critical to to solving these kinds of problems. But you know, I'll I'll prompt you for that. So as you see on the homework, you know, I, I ask you explicitly, you know, what are some of the assumptions and what are the boundary conditions that you can that you're going to apply on these Navier Stokes. Okay. Okay. So let's list uh, let's list uh, the, the common assumptions that you're going to make. And what they and what they mean and and how they actually simplify your Navier Stokes equations. Okay. All right. So first, let's talk about one that we've talked about before, actually, and that's steadiness. Okay. And we know from RTTs that when we assume that the uh, problem is steady, then we assume that nothing changes with time. And so what this basically means is that any, any derivatives with respect to time are equal to zero. Right. And so this is one, you know, that, that we've, we've known from RTT before, because, you know, from RTT, you know, when we have a steady situation, then our accumulation term, which, you know, has a time derivative with respect to time, um, is equal to zero. So it's the same thing with Navier Stokes. When Navier Stokes, we have this first um, guy right here, uh, du dt. And so when we assume a steady condition, then that guy has to be equal to zero, okay? So pretty straightforward. All right, so the next big assumption that we make is that uh, the flow is incompressible. And so, you know, we've seen this guy before with, uh, with Bernoulli as well, and it has the same definition. And so incompressible basically means that the density is gonna be um, constant. And uh, what this allows us to do uh, is that it, it allows us to use um, kind of the simple form of the continuity equation. Okay? And so the equations that I wrote on the previous um, page actually already implicitly in, in, uh, assume incompressible, but it's still important to write out for your problems. Okay? Okay. All right. So if we assume incompressible, then we can use the, this equation right here for conservation of mass. Okay. And that's really important because it's, uh, um, you know, without, without incompressibility, you know, our conservation of mass expression actually becomes a lot more complicated. So the fact that we can use this is actually a godsend and, and, it, and it's actually going to help us out a lot once we start solving the problems. Okay. okay. And so those are two guys that we've seen before. And so this third one is, is something that's going to be new. And this is the assumption of one dimensional flow. Okay. You can basically summarize this and say that, you know, the, uh, the flow is just one D. Okay. And what this assumption says is that uh, we assume that the flow only goes in a single direction. And so remember, you know, our velocity is, is a vector, right? So velocity has three components, u, v, and w, okay? Um, and so if we assume one dimensional flow, then what we're gonna assume is that two of these components are equal to zero, okay? And so for an example, let's say that we have one d flow in x direction, okay? 
And so what this means is that the Y components and the Z components of the flow uh, are going to be zero. Okay, so V is equal to W is equal to zero. Okay. And so basically, if we go back to our Navier-Stokes and any term that has a V and a W, we can just go ahead and cancel them out if we assume one dimensional flow. Okay. And a lot of times you can tell that it's one dimensional flow just from the figure, because from the figure, you should see the velocities going in one direction. Um, so I'll, I'll also tell you right now that, you know, for everything in this class, everything, um, you know, that we're going to be doing is, is one dimensional flow, at least in terms of Navier-Stokes. Because uh, once you start, once you introduce kind of a second velocity component, then things get uh, extremely complicated and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be impossible to solve. So. For everything in this class, you can you can assume it's 1D flow, but I, I still want you guys to write it down because it's it's an important uh, assumption. Because right? uh, you know when you're out there in practice doing fluid mechanics problems or you know working on fluid mechanic devices, um, you know you want to you want to you want to really make sure that this is a valid assumption for for those situations. But for all the problems I'm going to give you, they're they're just going to be 1D flow. Okay. Uh, any uh, any questions on these assumptions so far? Yeah, for the one-dimensional flow, uh, if we have an example going in the y direction, will that indicate that u is equal to w, which is equal to zero? Then exactly right, okay. right. So if you have one D flow that's going in some other direction, you know, you want to make sure that you you cross up the correct velocity components. Right, right. So I can yeah. just treat u v w as x y z then. Exactly right. Okay. Yeah, and actually, you know, that's that's an interesting um, segue into the homework problem. So the homework problem, you know, it's uh, I'm asking to solve for the velocity. Of, of fluid going down a slope, right? And so if you draw kind of the vector that goes down the slope, you know, it might look like this. And so you might think that it's actually, a, it's, it's a two dimensional flow because it's, you know, it's, it's, um, it's angle. But, you know, if you notice one other thing in the problem that I drew the X, Y coordinates kind of uh, to match along with the slope, okay? And so even though this, this vector here is, is slanted, um, you know, you can still treat the flow as one dimensional if you have your um, your coordinate axes tilted just like this. Okay. And so 1D flow does not mean that the flow aligns perfectly with like, you know, horizontal axis, a vertical axis. And so all 1D flow just means is that the flow just goes in one direction. Um, and if that direction is slanted, you might have to tilt your, your coordinate axes to kind of you know, account for that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's the first three assumptions. Right, so the next one is really important too. And so the next one, um, you know, I'm, I'm gonna combine kind of, uh, you know, two, two assumptions that you might make into one, um, uh, into one statement. And that's the assumption of negligible forcing. Okay. Okay. And so what does this mean? And so uh, what this means is that, you know, we can assume uh, under some assumptions, we can assume some of our forcing terms are zero, okay? And so in Navier-Stokes, we actually have two forcing terms, okay? Okay. And so the first forcing term is our pressure gradient. Okay. okay. And the other forcing term is gravity. And so depending on the situation, you might be able, you might be able to assume that one or both of these are going to be zero. Um, and so, you know, how you decide whether, you know, one or both of these are zero is you kind of have to kind of look at the problem. And, you know, this, this tends to get easier as, as you do more problems, but there, there are certain clues that you can look at, um, for, you know, when, when to set these equal to zero. Okay. Okay. So I'll give you some, some kind of rules of thumb for this. Um, and I, and I'll try to be explicit, you know, as we, as we do a couple of these examples, just so you can see, 
Um, but I want you to kind of remember these rules of thumb just so for future problems, you can kind of make the same assumptions, okay? All right, so the first one, you know, gra uh, the gravity is only gonna be active if you have some verticality in your flow. And so since gravity is, is usually a vector that goes vertically down, you know, you're only going to have a gravity component, you know, if the flow is actually going, you know, down to some degree. So, you know, something like a waterfall where, you know, the water is going vertically, you know, from the top of the waterfall to the ground, um, the driving force for that is going to be gravity. Um, like the homework problem. So the homework problem, you know, we have fluid that's going down a slope. And so in that case, you know, the, the flow is not going perfectly vertical, but there is some, you know, but it does go, it does have some vertical component. And so in those situations, you know, gravity is going to be the, the driving factor. Uh, but what you'll see in, in the example that we're going to do in a little bit, um, you know, for flows that are purely horizontal, you know, we, we ignore gravity in those cases because, you know, for horizontal flow, you know, gravity is not going to, not going to take any effect. Okay. Okay. So that's the thing with gravity. And for the pressure gradient, you know, pressure gradient is only active when we usually, is usually only active when we have an internal flow. And so what do I mean by internal flows? And so internal flows are, are basically fluid flows that occur, you know, that are bounded by solid surfaces on, on every side. And so the most classic example of, a, of, of an internal flow is flow in a pipe. Okay. So in a pipe, you know, we basically have fluid that's basically encased completely, you know, on solids. Okay. Um, and so the, the main driving force usually for pipe flow is going to be a pressure gradient, right? So if you think of the, of the water that comes out of your faucet or comes out of your shower uh, or your bathtub, you know, there's, there's some kind of pressure gradient that's driving that flow. Uh, because, you know, what, what can happen in those flows is that, you know, you can apply a pressure force and then the solid surfaces will be able to contain all that pressure. Okay? Um, and so what, ha what happens for a, for a flow that's not contained, um, like the homework problem where you have flow going down a hill, you can apply a pressure gradient, but because one, uh, one side of the surface is kind of free to atmosphere, that pressure kind of, you know, kind of comes out like that. So, um, so for flows where you, know, you have a, you know, a, a connection to atmosphere, and in those cases, the pressure gradient is not going to be and so these are some, some things to look out for. Uh, another thing to look out for is, is just to re read the problem. So sometimes, you know, you'll, you'll read a problem and it says, you know, assume that there's no pressure gradient or assume that there's no um, gravity. So, you know, if you read the problem and it says that, then you can just follow those instructions and just assume, that, um, assume that's the case. But I still want you to write it down. So even if the problem says, you know, assume there's no pressure gradient, I still want you to write it down as an assumption because it's, you know, I want you to kind of be really explicit with these things. All right, uh, any questions on this so far? Right, uh, so even, even if the problem says you can assume, make some assumptions, like you can assume that the pressure gradient is zero, I still want you to write it down in your solution because you know, being very explicit with your assumptions in these problems is, is really, really important. Yep. All right, any other questions on, on this? Okay. Okay. So those are the assumptions, uh, and so that's usually the first thing that you're going to do. So the first thing you do when you do a pro when you start a problem is to write out the full Navier Stokes, um, write out your assumptions, and then simplify. Okay. But there's one more thing that we need to do before we uh, we actually solve the problem, and that's boundary conditions. Okay. 
So who's heard the term uh, boundary conditions before? Hopefully, hopefully everyone's seen it to some degree. Everyone's taken 308, right? And so what boundary conditions basically state is that uh, they basically specify how our solution behaves at the boundaries. And we need, we need these for these kinds of problems because even after we apply all our assumptions, we're still gonna be left with a, a differential equation to solve, okay? And so in order to actually properly solve that differential equation, we need to apply some boundary conditions, okay? And so for Navier-Stokes problems, um, since Navier-Stokes, we have the viscous term, which has a, a second order derivative, we're gonna need two boundary conditions um, to apply, okay? And so a lot of times these, uh, these boundary conditions are, are gonna be left up to, to you. Okay? So a lot of times, you know, for these problems, you know, I'm gonna give you a figure that, that kind of uh, corresponds with the problem. And then you need to decide from the figure, you know, what boundary conditions do we need to apply, okay? Um, and so there, there's two types of boundary conditions that, uh, that we can do, okay? And they all depend on whether the fluid either touches a solid surface or if it touches another fluid at the boundary, okay? Okay. And so the first boundary condition that we're going to um, go over is the no slip boundary condition. And so physically what this means is that any fluid that touches a surface has to match the surface, um, the velocity of that surface. Okay. And so the key here is, is solid surface, okay? And so if you see your fluid is, is in contact with a, a solid on one side, then you know you have to apply a no slip boundary condition, okay? And so what does this mean? Okay. And so physically, let's say that we have a situation like this, okay? Okay. And so let's say that we have fluid that's bound in between two different plates, okay? And the top plate, we're gonna say we're gonna pull with some velocity u, okay? And so we're basically making a fluid sandwich like this, okay? And so in between my hands, I would have basically the fluid in between. And then the top surface, we're going to kind of pull, like kind of like a, like a magic carpet, I guess, okay? And so what does this mean for the fluid that's in between these plates, okay? And so for the fluid that's directly in contact with the top surface, okay? And let's say that this, uh, this channel has a height of h, okay? And say so we say that y is equal to zero down here, okay? And so our origin is at the, uh, um, at the bottom. Okay, and so the fluid that touches this plate has to have a velocity of u, okay? And so the way that we can uh, describe this mathematically is we say that u, at a height h, okay, has to equal big U, okay? And so this is kind of one boundary condition that we're going to apply, okay? 
because the velocity that touches that top surface has to be big U. Okay. And then on this bottom surface, you know, we also have a solid surface here. Um, the velocity has to match that of the surface. Right? But since that bottom surface is not moving at all, what we can say is that U of zero has to equal zero. And so the velocity at location zero um, has to be zero because you know the bottom surface is, is not moving at all. Okay. Right. And so this is usually the form that the boundary conditions usually take. So on the first part of the boundary condition here, this is our velocity. Okay. This next part here in the parentheses, this is the location. And so we have to specify the location of our boundary condition. Okay. And in the last part of the boundary condition here, this is our value. Okay. And so in the case of a no slip boundary condition, we are basically going to say that the velocity at the solid surface has to match the velocity of that surface. Okay. And so this, this kind of mathematical equation is kind of the, you know, um, the, su the summary of, of that. Okay. Okay, any questions so far on uh, no slip boundary conditions? I know, I know it's all kind of like a little bit, you know, out there right now, but, um, you know, I, I want to be kind of, uh, I, I wanted to uh, kind of explain everything in detail first before we do an example, and then we'll do the example and we'll kind of, you know, show where everything kind of fits in. Okay. Question? The value, yes, yes. So the uh, um, so the question is the value is big U, and so for the top surface, you know, the velocity there has to be big U, which is the um, which is the velocity of the plate. Yeah. So that's something that we can specify. Yep. Okay. And so that's a no slip boundary condition. So this is um, so this is going to be pretty common. And so in every problem, there's actually going to be at least one solid, there, there has to be at least one solid surface. So no matter what, you're going to be applying a no slope boundary condition at least once. Okay. And then the other um, boundary condition that we can use for an average Stokes is a stress boundary condition. Okay. okay. And so a stress boundary condition applies when a fluid is in contact with another fluid. And so in this case, what we assume is that the shear stresses between the fluid are the same. Okay. okay. And so let's say that, you know, we have a situation like this where we have a solid surface on the bottom, okay? And we have fluid one right here. And then on top of that, we have fluid two, okay? And so just like before, let's say that the height of this, uh, of this film is H, okay? And so what the stress condition basically says is that the shear stresses are the same, okay? And so in order to express that, um, let's say that this is the Y direction, so things are going to be varying in the y direction. And so what we say is that du, dy of fluid 1, okay, so this is du1 dy at y is equal to h. Okay. And so what this notation basically says that is we evaluate the derivative of the velocity field and we evaluate that at y is equal to h. Okay. This has to be equal to the derivative of the second of the second fluid um, at h. Okay. Okay. And so that's what it basically means for the uh, for the stresses to be the same. Okay. Oh, actually, I forgot. 
And so these should have uh, viscosities as well. So there should be a, a mu1 um, on one side and a mu2 on the other side, okay? Because the way that we compute stress in a fluid is we take the viscosity and then we multiply it by the velocity derivative. And so if we have two different fluids, you know, they might have two different viscosities. And so that's why we, we make that, that case. Okay. But I do want to let you know of a, of a special case. Um, and that special case is actually, you know, um, relevant for the homework, is that if your fluid is in contact with atmospheric air. Okay. Oh, sure. Right. So, the, so basically what I, I, I just stated was that, you know, the, to compute the stress in a fluid, the stress is simply just the product of the viscosity. And so this mu right here is viscosity. Uh, dynamic viscosity. Okay. Uh, it's the product of the dynamic viscosity multiplied by the derivative of velocity. Okay. okay. And so that's how we got this boundary condition here. So um, for this left hand side of the equation here, I, I computed the stress in fluid one, and so fluid one is gonna be um, du, uh, du one dy times mu one, so that the product of the viscosity of fluid one times the velocity derivative in fluid one, evaluated at the location of the, uh, of the interface, so at y is equal to h, okay? This has to be equal to the stress in fluid two, which is the viscosity of fluid two multiplied by the velocity gradient um, in fluid two. So that's mu two times du two dy, and again, that's evaluated at y is equal to h, which is the location of the of the interface. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and so that's that's kind of the most general case. If you have one fluid bordering another fluid, so their stress has to be the same. And so a special case occurs when you have your fluid. Your fluid is in contact with atmospheric air. And so air compared to, um, compared to uh, a fluid um, or compared to a liquid um, has very, very low viscosity. Okay. And so in those situations, what you can assume, is so if you have, you know, a fluid, okay, and you have air on top, and so this is the case of what you have in the homework. Okay? Since air has such a low viscosity, you know, air basically has no, it, ex, it, it exerts very little shear stress, okay? Okay. And so in those situations, what you can assume is that for your fluid, What you can assume for the fluid is that du dy, or the derivative of the fluid at the interface, okay? And so wherever the fluid is in contact with the air, we can set that equal to zero. Because if the air is gonna produce very little shear stress because of very low viscosity, then we can basically say that the stress, uh, the shear stress of the fluid at the interface between the fluid and the air has to be basically zero. And so this is actually the boundary condition that you need to apply for the top part of the film on the homework problem. Okay? Because in the homework problem, we have a, a film of fluid flowing down a surface. And so at the top of that, you know, uh, we assume that the shear stress there is going to be equal to, to zero. Yeah. Sure. Um, so the, that last part, basically, I, I said that, you know, whenever you have a liquid that's in contact with air, um, because air has such a low viscosity, um, the air is going to exert very little shear stress. And so what that means is that we can assume that the stress of the fluid at the interface between the liquid and the air is going to be zero. And so mathematically, what that means is that the derivative of the velocity um, is going to be zero at the interface. Okay, okay. Uh, any more questions on stress boundary conditions?
Okay, and so let's uh, let's do an example. So I, I know that there, that was a ton of information at once, but you know, hopefully with this example, it uh, um, it becomes it all comes together. Okay. Okay. So let's uh, so let's do um, pressure driven flow between plates. Okay. And so the geometry looks like this. Okay. And so let's say that we have a top plate and then we have a bottom plate. Okay. So we have this like, you know, food sandwich. The width of the channel is equal to H. Okay. And let's say that Y is equal to zero at the bottom plate. Okay. So there's our, our origin is, is set down there. And since it's pressure driven, we know that there's going to be a velocity gradient or um, pressure gradient that drives the flow in this direction. Okay. And so what we want to solve for okay, we want to solve for the velocity as a function of y. Okay, and so since this is a uh, you know a problem where we're solving for the velocity distribution, you know, in a in a, in a situation where there's going to be viscosity, we're going to need to use Navier-Stokes in this case. Okay, and so I'm going to walk you through kind of the general uh, problem-solving process with this thing. Okay? And so the first thing for these um, Navier-Stokes problems is always to list out your assumptions. Okay? And so assumptions are going to be you know extremely important. So let's go ahead and list all of them. So first of all, we're going to assume steady flow. Um, so that's going to be valid basically in, in every in every problem. Okay. Okay. Next, we're going to assume incompressible. Right. Again, you know, we're going to uh, assume this basically all the time. Right. The next thing we're going to assume is a 1D flow. Okay. And in this particular case, we're going to assume the, the 1D flow is in the X direction. Okay. And the last thing that we're going to assume is that we're going to ignore gravity. Okay? And the reason for that is because we have just purely horizontal flow. Okay. Okay. So those are all our assumptions. And so now let's write out um, continuity and our Navier-Stokes equations. Okay? And so any questions on this page before we uh, um, we start writing out Navier-Stokes? Okay. Okay. And so, you know, when you're writing out your Navier-Stokes equations, the, the best place to start is usually with the continuity equation. First of all, because it's 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 a lot simpler than the momentum equation, and it usually gives you a lot of really good information. Okay, so let's start with continuity. Okay, so for our continuity equation, we have du dx plus dv dy plus dw dz. Okay, and all that's equal to zero. Okay, and remember the the the, the fact that we have an incompressible flow allows us to use this form of the continuity equation, okay? And so just because, you know, um, and so just, just by the fact that our density is constant lets us to do this. Okay, so let's start canceling out some terms, right? And so remember, one, one, um, one assumption that we made was that we had 1D flow, okay? 
in the x direction, right? And so what this means is that v is equal to w is equal to zero, okay? And so basically any term here that has v and w, we can just cancel it out, okay? So we have two of them. So we have this one right here. And so we're gonna cancel this guy out because we're, we're setting v is equal to zero. And then we're also going to cancel out the second guy because w is equal to zero. Okay. And so notice, you know, what I did for when I canceled these terms out is that once I, uh, after I put the arrow to kind of slash it out, I put the reason that I'm canceling out underneath it. Okay. And so this is usually a good habit to get into, so that you know, when I'm when I'm reading through your work, it doesn't look to me like you're just kind of canceling out terms just to be convenient. So you know, I want you guys to simplify these equations, but I want you guys to kind of really understand you know, why you're canceling out some certain terms over the other ones, okay? And so to do that, you know, whenever you cancel out a term, it's always good to write out the reason why you're canceling out the term, kind of just um, very simply. So, you know, it doesn't have to be a long reason. A lot of times it's just, you know, just write a mathematical statement. And so right here we can just say that v is equal to, because v is equal to zero, then dv dy has to be zero as well, okay? And so after we cancel out those terms, we're left with just du dy is equal, or du dx is equal to zero, okay? Okay, and so this might seem something that's random, but we're, at, we're actually gonna use this, um, you know, in a bit, okay? Okay, and so that's continuity. And so now let's write out the momentum part of Navier-Stokes, okay? And so, you know, as you, as you start to do these problems some more, you know, I think, you know, you guys will get good and, and start to realize that certain terms are going to be zero. But even then, you know, whenever you're doing these navier stokes, I want you to write out the full equation and then cancel out the terms, you know, just like you did right here. Okay. So let's write out all the terms. And so there's our entire, um, you know, momentum part of Navier-Stokes, okay? And so remember, right now we can't solve this, uh, but we can cancel out a ton of these terms because of our assumptions, okay? So let's go ahead and start, um, start rolling with that. Okay? So first of all, let's cancel out the time derivative term, okay? And remember, the, uh, the reason we cancel that out is because of, you know, we assume that our flow is steady, okay? Next, we're gonna cancel out the second term because the second term has a V in it, right? And so any term with a V, we're just gonna set it equal to zero. Right? And so same thing with the next term. So since uh, the next term has a W, uh, we're gonna set that equal to zero because that because um, of our assumption of one dimensional flow. Okay. And then we can, also, we can also cancel out the gravity term because uh, we know from the problem that there's no component of gravity that goes along with the flow, okay? Okay. Okay. And so that's, you know, all the terms that we can cancel out directly from our assumptions, okay? But we have, a, we have one more thing that we can do um, and that's our, and we can apply our result from continuity, okay? And so what continuity is basically saying is that, you know, any derivative with respect to x of the velocity has to be zero, okay? Okay. And so now what we can do is we can take kind of a second pass at this, at these equations um, and eliminate any um, any term that has a, a derivative of the velocity with respect to x, okay? And so actually there's two of them. 
And so we have this guy right here, which is u times du dx. And then we have this guy, which is d squared u dx squared. Okay? And so both of these guys involve some derivative of u with respect to x. And so just like the other terms, we can cancel these guys out, okay? And the reason we can cancel them out is because of continuity. Okay. All right. And so that's the, uh, you know, that's, that's, you know, a lot of the terms that we've eliminated and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, one more term that you can usually eliminate in these cases, um, and that's this guy at the end, okay? And the assumption that we're gonna make, it, which is, you know, usually not that explicit a lot of the times, is that we're going to ignore any variations in the Z direction, okay? Um, and, you know, the, the way that we can justify that assumption is we can say that the channel is really, really wide, right? And so in this particular problem, the Z direction is coming out of the page, right? And so what we can say is that if the channel is really, really wide, then we don't see, we don't observe any changes in that Z direction, okay? And so we're gonna cancel out that guy too. Um, and so that's, that's usually gonna be the case in, in these problems because, you know, um, you, with, pen and, with pencil and paper, you know, it's, it's, it's way too much work to consider, you know, um, any kind of variations in 3D like that. So all the flows that you're going to consider are 2D. And so 2D flows basically, uh, or, you know, planar flows, I should say, you, you ignore any variations. In so that's not, a, that's not a, you know, an explicit assumption, but it's, it's one that we have to make in order for us to solve this equation. Okay. okay, so after we apply all those assumptions, you know, most of these terms cancel out, and the only ones that we have left are just the pressure gradient and this one viscosity term. And then we're going to work with those in order to solve the equation. Okay. Okay. Any questions on uh, on how we applied our assumptions so far? Yeah, the uh, gravity term. Uh, it's only based on the x direction. Will there ever be a case where we actually um, uh, utilize gravity? Yeah, there is, and it's actually on the homework. And so in the homework, uh, you know, we we have a the slope, right? And so uh, yeah. in the slope, we have the x direction that goes down that way. So there's, there's going to be a component of gravity in that direction. So it's not going to be full gravity. It's not just going to be g by itself, but it's going to be, you know, some component of gravity that goes in that direction. Yeah. Based on the angle, right? Exactly. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And so now that we've canceled out basically a ton of these terms, let's, let's write out what we have left. Okay. And so what we have left is basically zero is equal to minus one over rho dp dx, okay? Okay, plus nu, we're nu right here, this is our kinematic viscosity, times partial squared u, partial y squared. Right, so after applying all our assumptions and canceling the terms, this is all that we're left with. Right? And so now uh, we need to solve this equation for u. Okay. Okay. And so usually in these problems, what you're going to assume is that the pressure gradient is constant. And so even though we have this kind of um, scary looking derivative of pressure right here, we can just assume that this guy is just a constant. Okay? And so this is what you're gonna assume most of the time in your problems because it's, uh, um, you know, it mathematically makes things easier to solve. And so all that means basically is that, you know, the, the derivative of pressure, you know, as you go throughout the pipe, that thing is just gonna be constant, okay? okay. And remember the, the distinction between density and P right here. So remember on the, on the denominator here, I have one over rho. And so this is P without a ponytail, so that's gonna be density. And on top here, I have P with the ponytail and that's pressure, okay? Okay, and so let's move this pressure term to the other side. And so we have minus, and we, so we have positive 
1 over density times dp dx. Okay. Uh, it's going to be equal to nu, which is going to be our viscosity, um, times d squared u dy squared. Okay. And so you'll notice that I changed the derivatives on the velocity term to a normal derivative uh, because we no longer, we've eliminated every other, you know, independent variable. So we've eliminated x and z. And so this velocity here is only going to be a function of y. Okay. okay. And so I'm going to divide by nu. Okay. And I'm going to kind of flip this around just to kind of make it a little bit easier. Okay. So I'm going to d squared u dy squared is equal to 1 over nu times density okay, times dp dx. Okay. And this product of density times um, kinematic viscosity, this is going to be our dynamic viscosity. Okay. So it's going to be 1 over um, mu of dp dx. And so at this point, in order to solve for u, we basically have the second derivative of u with respect to y is equal to 1 over the viscosity times pressure gradient. Okay? And so the way that we're going to solve for u is that we're going to integrate. Okay? So let me find integral on these guys. Okay? And so the integral of d squared u dy squared is going to be du dy. Okay? And on the right-hand side, we're going to have 1 over mu partial p partial x, okay? And since this whole term right here is a constant, when we integrate this out, we simply just get a y, okay? okay. And then since, you know, we're, we're doing an indefinite integral right here, uh, we're going to apply, um, we're gonna add an arbitrary constant. And so, uh, in addition to that, we're gonna uh, we're gonna integrate this one more time. Okay. And so, if we integrate one more time, we get u of y is equal to one over mu dp dx. Okay. Y squared over two plus c one y plus c two. Okay. And so, this right here is our velocity solution. But we're not done yet. So uh, the thing that we have to solve for in this case is we have to solve for C1 and C2. Okay. Okay. And in order to solve for C1 and C2, we're going to use our boundary conditions. Okay. Right. Any questions on, uh, on this so far? Uh, yeah, how come um, we decided for the uh, for the viscosity uh, uh, inner term, the uh, yeah. d squared u uh, dy squared? Um, why is that reverted back to a normal derivative and not a partial this time? Right. So we reverted back to a normal derivative because we eliminated basically every other um, independent variable, and so you know velocity is actually going to be a function of t, x, y, and z. But we basically eliminated the t dependence, we eliminated the x dependence, and we eliminated the, the z dependence. And so since u is only going to be a function of just one variable in this case, um, then we can transform it back into a normal derivative. OK. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yep. OK. OK. And so um, now we need to apply our boundary conditions. Okay. And so let's go back to our, our original problem geometry. Okay. And in this, in this problem geometry, we have two solid surfaces. Okay. okay. And so in this case, we have you know, a solid surface at y is equal to 0 and a solid surface at y is equal to h. Okay. And in this particular case, neither solid surface is moving. Okay. 
And so in these cases, we can, we can basically set, apply a no slip boundary condition on the bottom surface and the top one. And so what this means is that u at zero, at y is equal to zero is gonna be zero, okay? And also u of h are gonna be zero, okay? And so these right here are our boundary conditions. Right? And so let's apply these boundary conditions to our solution, okay? All right, so let's apply the first one, because that one's simple. Okay? And so we have u of y is equal to zero, and so let's take our velocity solution from the previous page and then apply it at y is equal to zero. Okay? And so we have one over mu times dp dy times zero squared over two plus c1 times zero plus c2, okay? Right. And so since we have zero multiplying these guys, it's gonna cancel out. And then what we get is c2 is equal to zero. Okay. So that's one of the constants. So we solve for one of them there. Okay. Okay. Now let's apply our other boundary condition, which is u of h is equal to zero. Okay. And so same thing, we're just going to plug in h in for y into our boundary condition. So we have one over mu dp dx times h squared over two plus c1 times h. We already know that C2 is equal to zero, so we're not going to um, solve for that, okay? And so we can take this boundary condition and solve for C1, okay? And we get that C1, and so we divide by H and subtract it from the other side. We get C1 is equal to minus uh, one over two mu dp dx times H. And so what we can do now is we can plug in these values for C1 and C2, and then we can get our final solution for um, the velocity. Okay. Okay. Any questions on, on this? Right, question? Yep, go ahead. So the bottom equation says uh, C1 is equal to minus one over two mu dp dx times h. Yeah, so I basically solved for, for C1 in that case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the previous problem you solved for uh, dp dy. Yep. Yeah. And the second problem you did uh, dpdx. Oh, they, they should all be dpdx. Sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so dpdx is a constant. Yeah. And so that just I see you. Oh, go that ahead. indicates the direction of flow for that, right? Yeah, so dpdx is the, uh, the gradient of pressure in the direction of, of the flow. So the question is, how did I cross out C1 times zero? So um, it's not C1 of zero, it's C1 multiplied by zero, right? And so the way I canceled that out is because in our, in our velocity solution here, we have C1 times Y, and then we plug in Y is equal to zero, and so that cancels out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so it should be DX, okay? All right. And so now that we've, uh, we've um, done all that, we can write our final solution. And so final solution is u of y is equal to one over two mu, okay, times dp dx times uh, y squared, okay, minus one over two mu dp um, dx, times h times y, okay? So I'm noticing in the notes that there's a typo with and I, I use, um, in the lecture notes I use x, but it should all be y because it's u as a function of y, okay? Okay, and so if you plot this flow, okay, or you plot the velocity profile, okay, what you'll notice here is that there's a, a, a quadratic term, okay? And so what that quadratic term will do is that it'll make sure that our velocity profile is 
parabolic. Okay. And so parabolic velocity profiles are very characteristic of, uh, of pressure-driven flows. And so a lot of times if you have flow that's in a pipe that's driven by pressure, then the velocity profile that you observe is going to be parabolic. Okay. <clears throat> it's so famous that people, people say it's called just parabolic flow. Okay. And just a little bit of trivia. So this is, this is not really important at all, but um, you know, some people might refer to it like this. So the first person to actually solve this equation like this and to observe parabolic flow um, was two, uh, was two um, researchers. And so one of the researchers named Hagen, like Hagen does, but just Hagen in this case. And the second guy, his last name was Bussell. And so oftentimes this type of flow is called Hagen Poissel flow. And so I always spell Poissel wrong. So that's probably um, not the right spelling. Um, but that's, uh, that's what this flow is attributed to. So sometimes it's actually just attributed to Poissel. And so if you hear Poissel flow, that means that your flow is parabolic you know, within two, within two plates. Yeah. Okay. So you might hear that term, you know, outside of this class. And, you know, if you hear that term, that's, that's what it means. But, you know, it's not, in the grand scheme of things, it's not that important. If Boisel was still alive, he might punch me, but he's probably dead, so it's okay. Okay, any final questions on, on this example? Okay, so I've, I have one more example to note, so I don't know if I'm gonna have time to go through all of it, but I'll, I'll kind of hit the highlights uh, for you, okay? Um, and so the second example, you know, has a, kind of has almost everything else going on for it, okay? And so um, this example is gonna be a thin film of fluid. Uh, moving up a conveyor belt. So on the left-hand side here, we're going to have a conveyor belt, and it's going to be moving upwards. Okay? It's going to be moving upwards with the velocity called u felt. Okay? And then on this conveyor belt, we have a thin film of fluid. Okay? It's going to be exposed to atmosphere here. And so the film is going to have a width d. And then since this conveyor belt is vertical, we're going to have a gravity force that kind of opposes it uh, in the other direction. Okay, and so in this problem, we want to solve uh, not for the horizontal velocity, but we're going to solve for the vertical velocity as a function of x. Okay. okay, and so just like before, let's start with our assumptions. And so if our first assumption is going to be steady, right, as it always is. Right, our second assumption is going to be incompressible. Right, our third assumption is going to be 1D flow in the y direction this time. And so this means that u and w are going to be equal to zero. Okay. And our fourth assumption is that um, you know we're, our flow is going to be mostly gravity driven, and we're going to ignore the pressure gradient. And so from this, we can write out our continuity equation and our momentum equation, just like we did before, okay? Okay. 
any questions on the uh, on the problem setup? Okay. All right. So let's start with continuity. So continuity is going to be du partial u partial x plus partial v partial y plus partial w partial z. Okay, and that's going to be equal to zero. All right. So let's apply our assumption of one d flow. All right. And so in our assumption of one d flow, basically any term that involves u. Or any for any term that involves w, which is going to be equal to zero. Okay, and so we're we're going to cancel out those two terms. So du dx is equal to, is going to be zero, and dw dz is going to be equal to zero. And so what we get from continuity is that db dy has to equal to zero. Okay. Okay. And so I want to make kind of a, a quick note here. Um, you know, we, we, we basically got um, a similar result in our previous example. And what this basically says is that the V velocity in, uh, in the Y direction is not changing, okay? And so uh, one way that we can say this is that the velocity is not changing in the flow direction. And so another name for this, uh, for this phenomenon, where you know, the flow is not changing in the direction, the, the velocity is not changing in the direction that it's flowing, another way to describe that is we can say that the flow is fully developed. And so we'll, we'll come back to this idea, you know, after the midterm once, uh, when we talk about boundary layers, but I want you guys to just be kind of introduced to this idea where, you know, if the velocity is not changing in the flow direction, we say that the velocity profile has fully developed at that point. Okay. Okay. And so now let's write out the momentum equation. Okay, so I'm going to write out the full um, expression just like before. And so this is going to be in the y direction. So we, I haven't written this down explicitly, um, but this is kind of the y version of the um, Navier-Stokes equations. And so we have all the acceleration terms on the left, and then we have minus one over rho dp dy plus gy plus nu d squared v dx squared plus d squared v dy squared plus d squared v dz squared. Okay. And so let's start canceling out terms just like before. And so the first term is going to be canceled out because of steadiness. Okay. All right. So the next term is going to be canceled out because u is equal to zero. Okay. The next term is going to be canceled out because w is equal to zero. The next term is going to be canceled out because of there's no pressure gradient. Okay. Okay. Uh, this term in, in the um, in here is going to be canceled out because of continuity. Right. We found that dv d, um, dy is equal to zero, and same with this guy. And so continuity is going to cancel out any derivatives of v with respect to y. Okay. Okay. 
And then finally, we're going to cancel out that last term over there because we're going to ignore any variations in z. Okay. And so the terms that we have remaining here are going to be this viscous term and then this gravity term. Okay. And so you can just follow kind of the same process as we did before there, where you can basically move the gravity to the other side, divide by um, uh, the viscosity, you integrate twice, and then you use your boundary conditions and solve C1 and C2. Okay. Um, and so, you know, with this example, you know, we saw kind of a, a different situation, but you can see we're following the same process. So, uh, and just so that you guys can finish this, uh, this equation on your own, let me give you the boundary conditions for this guy. Okay. And so our first boundary condition will be the condition at the belt. Okay. And so when X is equal to zero, right? And that's basically when our, uh, you know, we're gonna be at the belt right here then since our fluid contacts a solid surface, we have a no-slip boundary condition. So we have V of X equals zero is equal to U belt, okay? And our other boundary condition is gonna be DV DX, okay? At X is equal to, um, what's the width here? The width here is D, I think, right? Our other boundary conditions, since our um, since our film contacts um, atmospheric air, and so it's, we're going to have a stress-free boundary condition. So the uh, the derivative of v with respect to x at x is equal to d is going to be equal to zero. Okay. Right. And so the remaining details are are in the notes, but you know I would definitely kind of finish up this example because it gives you a pretty different look than our than our. Okay, so I know I'm over time a little bit, so I apologize, but are there, are there any uh, final questions on, on this example here? Go back to page here. So the question is, is the Z direction always ignored in this class? Yes, yeah, so for our class, you know, we're gonna always ignore the Z, the Z direction. Okay, um, so I'll stick around if there's any more questions. Um, oh, question. So the question is how come for homework for the gravity turns out to be 9,800 and not 9.8? Um, and that's because you're, you're multiplying it by density. And so it's because the density is 1,000, uh, you know, I, I multiply the density all throughout the equation. So 1,000 times 9.8 is 9,800. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so I know I'm a little bit over time today, so I apologize. So I'll, I'll stick around and, and answer any more questions. Uh, but if not, you guys are free to go. So thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, there's a new minute paper on Canvas if you want to fill that out. Uh, but if not, uh, have a great weekend, everybody. Study guide will be up later today, and then the poll will be up later today, too. So make sure you guys vote on those things, okay? Uh, so thank you, everybody. Have a great weekend, and I'll see you on Monday. Yes, okay. happy Halloween, everybody. Yes. Thanks, Dr. Tran. Enjoy your weekend. Thanks, you too. Thanks. Good luck on your midterm, too. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, professor, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I have a question on one of the assumptions for negligible forcing. Yep. Mm -hmm. On the pressure gradient, just to be sure, the pressure gradient is only zero when there's an open side to the CV, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So and you, you, most of the time when you have an open surface like this and it's exposed to air, then you can assume the pressure gradient is going to be zero. Okay, so if they're all covered, then there is a pressure gradient that is not zero? Most of the time. So there, there might be some cases where you have a, a flow that's completely covered, uh, but there, might, there still might not be a pressure gradient. But they, but they would tell you that in the problem, um, if that's the case. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, forward, yes. Mm -hmm.
All right. Thank you, Professor. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right, have a good day. You too. All right. Are there uh, any final questions from, from you guys? Okay. Uh, so I'm going to end the call. So, uh, so thank you everybody for tuning in. Um, have a great weekend and I'll see you on Monday.